ashamed to face the pain. And in your presence, Lord, all our fears are washed away. They're washed away. your voice with us this morning. We welcome you here this morning, Lord Jesus. Be welcomed in this place this morning, Lord, as we honor you with our voices, with our hearts, with our song, Lord God, we honor you. Because when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, God, all our fears are washed away. Let's sing that once again. Because when we see you, Lord, because when we see you, we find shame to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away. They're washed away. Shining down on me when the world's 
all as it should be. Blessed be your name.
Jesus, Jesus, my heart will see no other name. Jesus, Jesus, my heart will see no other name. saying I'm running to your arms we're going to invite the prayer partners to come forward and there's some that are here this morning that just need to run into the arms of Christ and the beauty of the body of Christ is those arms look a lot like our faces are connected to those arms we're here to open up this time because we believe in the prayers of the body we believe in the power of connecting with someone else in prayer and where two or more gathered, Christ is in the midst of it. So this morning, if there's a hurt in your life, if there's a need in your life, if there's lack in your life, today, today is your day. Today is your day to be whole and to be filled and be restored. Run. Run into his arms. Mary Beth. Good morning. It's almost Valentine's Day where all the men feel nervous and all romance is everywhere thinking about love but I want you to put all those thoughts aside all those stresses of that day aside and think about what God says in his word about love about true love and remember that real love God's love is a decision more than it is an emotion reading from 1 Corinthians 13 love suffers long and is kind love does not envy love does not parade itself it's not puffed up does not behave rudely does not seek its own is not provoked thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Let these prayer partners come alongside you and, and help you feel the Father's love this morning. Let the Father permeate you with His love, this kind of love that's in His Word. He is faithful and his love never, never fails. My heart will sing no other name Jesus Jesus My heart will sing no other name, Jesus, Jesus, my heart will sing. No other name, Jesus. Let's fill this place with that name this morning. Say, my heart will sing, Lord. No other name. Jesus, Jesus, my heart will say, no other name, we lift your name, Jesus, yes, Lord, Jesus, my heart will say, no other name, Jesus. 
compares to your embrace, light of the world forever.
There's none beside you, Lord. Who is like the Lord? Who is worthy beside you, God? Praise you, Lord God. You know, through Scripture, when Moses was sent to Egypt, he said, who, who shall say sent me? He said, I am. When Jesus wanted to tell him how to get into the presence of God, he said, I am the way. When he talked about the provision for, for heaven, for salvation, I am the bread of life. When we talk about our needs and our, the lack in our lives, when we focus on those things, we move our eyes from the great I am. This morning, I want to encourage you. If you're here, I know we've had prayer time. I know that's been going on. But I believe God's wanting to do something in our body where he reveals himself this morning as the great I am in community. So this morning, if, you, if there's a need in your life, if you lack resources, if you lack a healing, if there's something going on, you lack peace, you want the great I am to invade your life. I don't want you to walk. I want you to run. Run down here and let's begin to invade heaven. Let's begin to bombard the great I am and say, here I am. Here I am. Meet my need, Father. I'm here before you, the great I am. Let's sing that one more time. Let's come to the altar. Praise you, Father. The mountains shake before me. The demons are mine. Praise At you, Father. The mention of your name, King of Majesty. There is no power in hell or any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great I am. The great
like you, Jesus. No one like you, Jesus. <clears throat> the great I am is over your life. He's in your presence. He's in your midst. And I believe right now he is healing and changing destinies. Just allowing to be the I am in your life. Whatever hurdle that is, whatever mountain that is, whatever struggle that is, allow the great I am to rule in your life. Amen. Let's give God a hand. Father God, we just receive that. We receive in Jesus' name. We receive it in Jesus' name. We receive it. Oh, goodness. Well, guys, as you make your way back to your seat, I don't want you to, I don't want you to go back to your seat in, in, a, in, a, in a sense that we're going to forget what God's doing. I want you to go back in preparation for what God has yet to do. When we, when we serve God, we're amazed every day at how he pours out his blessings in our lives. Last week, if you were here, you got to see Chester Moore. Didn't Chester do a phenomenal job last week? Give Chester a hand. I saw Chester in here just a second ago. Chester, you did a great job, brother. But your daughter, your daughter running down the aisle stole the show. Amen. I mean, when we begin to celebrate what God has done, I just think of what Chester said about God loving us so much that he situated things over here in the Western Hemisphere because he wanted to change the destiny of one in the Eastern Hemisphere. And he began to realign things so that we could celebrate a week ago a little girl running down the aisle that was told she wouldn't walk and she wouldn't for sure run. And she may not communicate. And she's running down to daddy. We can never forget the great I am. Can roll over any situation. Amen. This morning, if you're a baptismal candidate, would you please, will you dismiss you now at the doors to my left, your right? Pastor Dan's going through there now to prepare for baptism. We want you to go ahead and do that. We have some announcements we want you to see. And then after that, we'll have some follow-ups on that. Please show the announcements. Good morning, and welcome to Community Church. We're so glad you joined us today. It's going to be a great morning. We're going to learn how to celebrate as a family and love each other. There are a lot of exciting things going on here at Community Church. Check it out at the website and on Facebook. For example, we have a blood drive happening on February 21st at 3.30 p.m. in the choir room behind the sanctuary. Chip Brim will be here March 4th and 5th, and he is part of Champions for Christ. We also have a couple of mission trips coming up. For instance, the Senior High is going with Pastor Dan to Miami on July 23rd. The Honduras trip coming up with Ms. Mary Beth will have a meeting after this service in the Large Commons for information about that. On February 24th through 26th, we have our Missions Emphasis Weekend.
Come to the Impact Our World booth and sign up for a 30 minute to an hour slot anytime from the 24th at noon to Saturday the 25th at 6 p.m. We want these 30 hours to be completely soaked in prayer. We even have a prayer room ready just for you. Will you fast with us? Our fast will start Friday at noon for 30 hours. Please be safe and do what you can and give up something for our world. Will you give? Come by our Impact Our World booth and make any donation of money and then put your thumbprint on our globe. Will you also give your time? Friday at 6 p.m. we will have a service with a missionary telling us why we should give, fast, pray, and go. Then Saturday from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. we'll have a wonderful time praying and creating different booths to represent each country we're going to be supporting. We'll leave these up for Sunday morning so that people can go through and experience the different cultures and also give and pray towards these people. Last but not least, will you go? God says that we should go into all the world and make disciples. Start in your own neighborhood. Do an act of kindness for our 20,012 acts of kindness. I guess you weren't clapping because I was coming up. It was a video. Uh, I want to welcome you this morning if you're part of our church family. Uh, we welcome visitors. I don't want to forget you, though, our church family. If this is your church home, then we're glad to see you. If you're just in town visiting someone and passing through this week, we hope this Sunday's blessed. But if you're here and you're looking for a church home, uh, we encourage you to look around because this is a wonderful place. Connie and I have been here some 30 years, and I spent several years in Gideon's going around different churches and speaking. And when we travel, we go to some wonderful churches. We've seen some great people, some great ministries, some wonderful churches. But I told Brother David over the years, over and over, I'd come back and say, I hadn't found anywhere that I'd rather have as a church home than community church right here in Orange. So you did a good thing being here today. And uh, it's, uh, the problem is sometimes when you're a bigger church, it's easy to slip in and slip out, and nobody noticed you, and they just think, well, maybe they're regular, and I hadn't seen them before. So I want you to take just one minute. Uh, you don't, you, you, Clay don't stand up, but you don't have to go far. Uh, just take a minute, reach around, shake a hand with somebody beside you, and tell them good morning. I'll tell you, that's one of the things we do so well, and that's fellowship, and uh, it's uh, easier to get folks up than it is to get them back down, and I, I, that's a good problem to have, that people want to keep right on visiting, and we appreciate that. Uh, Connie and I, I said we got married about 30 years ago, uh, 30 years and about four months ago, and I was a young lawyer practicing law, and as I began to incorporate my faith into my law practice, I began to realize that every morning I woke up unemployed. Uh, I went to work, and somebody walked in and hired me, or they didn't. And uh, they said, oh, well, you're a lawyer. Well, I am. And they either walked in and hired me, or they didn't. And we began to learn what it meant to live by faith. Uh, because you'd get up in the morning, and you'd see if you had a job or not. And a lot of people didn't really appreciate that's the way it worked. But I'd go down there, sit at my desk, either somebody walk in the door or not. And we began to experience what it was like to trust God for our provision. Uh, that was pretty easy to trust Him because we didn't have anything. We didn't have a savings account, and we didn't have anything else to trust. And we learned to trust Him. But after about four years, things got better, and we built up a little savings account. For the first time in our marriage, we had some money in a savings account. When I married Connie, I thought if you had a savings account, you just didn't have a good imagination because I could find somewhere to spend the money. And so we finally, she persuaded me, we saved up some money, and I bought a little office. And I started remodeling it. And I was so grateful. We had the money. We didn't have to go to the bank. We could remodel that office. And the remodeling was going good. And the money was going far enough. We were going to use it all up. But it's going far enough. And I find myself getting up and getting grouchy. 
and irritable and snapping at people. And I couldn't figure out why. I've got a new office. We're remodeling it. We got the money. And as I prayed, God showed me what had happened. I'd taken my eyes off him as my source, and I put them on that savings account. I didn't have to pray for somebody to walk in the door. I had a fallback now. Now, savings accounts aren't bad things. But when you take your eyes off the great I am and put them on something else, you're going to be in trouble. Because something else will disappear pretty fast. And we found that out in recent years. And so I repented. I cried. I said, God, I am sorry. I had my eyes on you. I knew, even though the money walked in the door, even though the money came in the mail, that I knew you were my source. And I've forgotten that. And I don't want to ever forget it again. And God replaced that savings account miraculously. Different story for a different day. I mean, just overnight, he put it back once I knew that it could never be my source. And so over the years now, a lot of years have passed, and the way I have always kept that fresh in my mind is by being a giver because when I give I'm saying the state of Texas is not my source Orange County is not my source God is my source and as an act of faith I'm going to give something away to prove it and I tell you to this day it has sustained us when the stock market went it didn't ruffle my feathers because God wasn't short on money Okay? But if we put our money on something else, we'll be in trouble. I'm going to ask the ushers to come to receive the morning tithes and offerings. And as they come, I'm going to read to you from Psalm 20. He says, May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. May he remember all your sacrifices and accept your burnt offerings. May he give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. We will shout for joy when you are victorious and we'll lift up our banners in the name of our God. May the Lord grant all your requests. Then he goes on to say, Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He answers from his holy heaven. And the saving power of his right hand. Now listen to this. Some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we trust in the name of the Lord our God. We don't have to worry about horses and chariots. Not many of us are trusting in those. But 401ks and savings accounts. An employer out there. That's our horses and chariots. And today I'll remind you that some trust in chariots. Some in horses. But we trust in the name of the Lord our God, and we show that as we give. Father God, what a, what a thrill it is to be in your house today, Lord, and uh, to be able to praise and to worship you, Father. Lord, sometimes I just think when this building on Sunday mornings is just kind of a glimpse of what eternity may be like with you, Father. What a good God you are, Father, how faithful you are. Lord, we love you and we thank you. And, Father, we just want to continue to worship you right now as we give back that which belongs to you, Father. Thank you for loving us, God. And, Father, how I thank you for the freedom that we have to come in this building today, God. Thank you. You know, sometimes we ask questions like, what do we love about something? And uh, it's hard to put our finger on it. And when it comes to community church, the things that I love about the church are too, too many to list. Um, but the fellowship, the things that drive the daily actions, community church gives me that, and that's what I love. Being a part of community has changed my life in so many ways. I now have a, a, a peace in my heart, uh, a better understanding of our Lord's Savior, in a relationship with God like no other. What do I love about my church? Everything. Uh, you can get involved anywhere you want to. If you have a need, you can ask. If it's a, a true need, the church will meet it. Uh, if you have desires, passions, things you want to do, there's always a way through the church. And you can usually accomplish it. One thing I really love about community church is just having an opportunity to serve. Um, one of the things that come with 
a large church body is there's lots of needs to be met and community always has um, opportunities available to, you know, to help being a part of meeting those needs. What I like about uh, community uh, and how it changed my life is how the people come to, together you know, as, as one. People do still notice you and uh, Miss Duhon calling me for the very first time I think made an impact that forever has changed my life. Community church has changed my life by being ready when my life changed. I was able to find people that were uh, going through the same thing I was going through and experience the same things I had experienced. I think one thing people should know about community is that we're not judgmental, that you can walk in and we will love you no matter what you've gone through or you know what kind of hurts or past you've had. Uh, you can always come in and people can relate you know, to what you've gone through and offer you advice or offer you a loving shoulder or no matter what it is. It's a safe haven for anybody that's hurting or uh, has a broken marriage, a broken home. Uh, I just can't say enough, you know, it, it's a life-changing experience, has been for me. What is one thing that I wish everyone knew about community is once you get involved, it really does change your life. A community has a real passion for seeing people's lives changed through small groups, through discipleship. Um, they want to give you opportunities to, to get to know each other and to grow in your relationship with Jesus. It's, it's worship and we have an awesome worship team. Anytime you're in a bind or you're hurting, everyone here is more than willing to lend a hand, lend a shoulder, give you their heart. Everyone is passionate, they're honest, they're true. They, uh, they're just, they're friends. They're more than friends, they're brothers and sisters. I wish people knew that whenever they join a church like Community Church, they're immediately accepted. They're immediately a part of a family, uh, a group of people who care about what's going on, and you're immediately one of them. You're not waiting for your turn. You're not waiting for your chance. You're not waiting to be accepted. You walk through the doors, and you're already a part of Community Church. What do I love about my church, about Community Church, is the people. I love the people. I love this church, and I love the people. The people that you run into in this church, as being a greeter on Sunday mornings on that front door, I meet so many people that you can see that they're hungry and that they want to take and be part of this church. And, and I, just, I, I just enjoy being there on Sunday mornings to greet them, to let them know that, that, that God is in this church. speaks volumes. You know, I've watched your family and God's been doing some great things in families home. I'm so thankful for you. I'm glad that you're part of our family. And uh, since you're here to be baptized in my name, this is the lady saying I see her hand. I see her hand. There you go. <laughs> Thank you for making your public profession of faith. I baptize you in the Father, Son, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. Thank you. 
When he got ready to get baptized, I called him Chris. That's all I've ever known him by is Chris. That's not his name, though. But he said he likes Chris, so. Uh, John, Chris, what? <laughs> Chris, uh, because your profession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? Well, if you're uh, following along in your Bible, you can, uh, or in, the, in a, one of the apps, the version app on your Android or iPhone, iPad, smart device, you go to version, search our live events, we'll be there. Uh, if you'll turn in your Bibles, uh, we're going to look in uh, Matthew chapter 16. And began uh, talking this morning, you saw some uh, things about I love my church. And, you know, so often we are hesitant to talk about how much we love our church because we don't want to sound braggadocious. And I hope nothing in there sounded that it was prideful or bragging. But I'm telling you, there's something wonderful about being connected to the body of Christ. And there's something wonderful about belonging to a church home. There's a lot of wonderful churches around this area. Matter of fact, this morning we're going to pray for one of them. Uh, Pastor Demetrius Moffitt is at uh, First uh, Church of God here in Orange. I think it's uh, 911 Main Street. So uh, uh, it, real easy to remember. But he has, I talked to him this week, and he's new to the area. But he has a passion for unity. His church is joining other churches, and they're going into a 30-day of prayer and fasting for unity in Orange uh, among churches. So that's something we can join in to. And then also, he's asking that we pray for them, that they are in need uh, of a musician to help lead worship at their church. So will you pray with First Church of God, Pastor Demetrius Moffat, with me. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We lift up First Church of God here in Orange, and we declare your goodness over them. We ask that this morning that you will not only answer their prayers for unity in the body in Orange County, but you will also answer their need uh, for a worship leader and musicians in that church that they will not only have unity and ability to worship you, but they will experience your presence and power like never before. Father, I thank you for his vision for his church, his vision for Orange. And Father, I thank you that you've caused men and women of God to join together in Orange for a move of your spirit that will cross denominational lines, that will cross racial barriers, cultural differences economic differences, and see nothing but the great I am becoming manifest in our presence in Orange County. We thank you for him and his ministry and ask your blessings upon them that souls will be saved this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, well, good. This morning we're going to uh, talk about the fact that I love my church. I shared with you just uh, uh, earlier the idea of uh, last Sunday... Chester was teaching on uh, not only did I love God, I love my God, but I love my family. And the idea of love not being just an emotion that we feel, but a decision we make. So when we talk about loving God, we love him because he first what? 
loved us. And he didn't love us with a, with a, just a, uh, a feeling or let it, his love for us be ruled by feelings. He decides to love us and everything else was added for, to that. We get to love him back because of that. Because we get to decide to live a life that is honoring to him because we make the decision to love him. And when we love him, we begin loving one another. We begin to start in our families, and our families begin to transform. I want to tell you that the first indicator that you can find of your application of love of God is not your prayer time or your Bible study time. The best place you can find out, am I applying this, is looking at your children and your husband or your wife, looking at your family, because it begins with the love we show one another. And then we move from there, and then Chester shared that we can make a decision to love even thousands of miles away and love and bring into the family. Well, that's kind of where we're picking up this morning, is becoming a part of a family that is not just built around flesh and blood. Now, growing up in Southeast Texas, there's some uh, sayings that I learned growing up in Texas, uh, this area. And one of them was, blood is thicker than what? Water. And that meant if you weren't blood, and we had a word, blood kin, if you weren't kin folk, that, that you were water. But everybody else, we, we, we kind of circled the wagons at times. But I've discovered in the body of Christ that water becomes the blood of Christ. And those things where we may not share a kinship with through our family tree of mom and dad, we share a kinship with the kinsman redeemer that begins to be a part of his family and that which society would say is not as close. I found in my life that the body of Christ becomes substantially a part of my makeup, of who I am and the love that I have. And I, without uh, apology, say I love my church. I love being a part of not only the greater body of Christ, but I love community church. I love it not only because I'm the pastor here. I loved it when I was the associate here. And I didn't only love it when I was the associate here. I loved it when I would come and visit. Mary Beth and I were pastor in Illinois. We came down, and we, uh, the church was still in the large commons at that time when we came down. And we sat in there. We sat in worship. And it was phenomenal. And the people were friendly, and there were so many people that were, the, the one service was packed, and there were still people out in the hallway or in the foyer area talking, and you were hearing Brother David talking over them. And uh, I loved the fact that I never heard y'all hush back there, even though he could have. He didn't, because it was just a family and learning to worship together, and, and in the inconvenience of, of overlapping services, there was a love and a, a DNA. I remember loving community church before then. When I was a senior in high school, I came and I gave my life to Jesus Christ, and Brother David baptized me. And I remember I shared with Enoch, uh, 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 Victor Enard, that he, he prophesied over me a long time ago, and another lady prophesied over me. And I remember just feeling... As a, as a senior in high school, a love and a, and a vision bigger than me that other people had for me. And it made me love community church. That when we went and we began looking for churches, like Dennis said, that was the, kind of the litmus test was I was trying to find and searching for another community church. In fact, when I went to Illinois, I tried to recreate community church. And so what I'm telling you is that when we talk about I love my church, it's not just because of our architecture or the amount of seats we have. It's because of you. It's because of the body of Christ coming together and celebrating. I want you to know that our church and every church is much more than a building. It is much more than twice a week meetings or three times a week meetings. It is when we come together under the banner of Jesus Christ and we begin to love one another that we begin to understand what it means. And there's something that happens when we begin to love one another. We begin to see the body of Christ grow. And in fact, Jesus, whenever Peter said that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, in Matthew chapter 16, he said, I will build my church upon that revelation. When we get together, we are not trying to build the church. We are celebrating what Jesus Christ is building. You are here this morning, not because we have the best worship, not because we, definitely not because we have the best preaching, not because we have the most comfortable seats or the best temperatures. You are here this morning because Jesus Christ is building us into the body, the local body of Christ. And we come together 
not to try to build something, but to celebrate that which is being built by God himself. And to that we can celebrate and understand that God's doing something wonderful. And so we say with confidence, I love my church. And there's three reasons. There's many more, but I start out with three reasons for loving our church. I love my church because I am encouraged to become. Community church, I told you, began to encourage me, but I know that I am not alone, that have been encouraged to become. I want you to remember our purpose statement, the reason we exist. Community church exists for the following reason, to help people become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Community church exists to help people become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Can you say that with me? Because I'll keep repeating it till you do. Community church exists to help people become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Notice that word become. It's not that it's instantaneous. It's, just, it's a process. And we want to be a part of that process in people's lives. Helping them become what God ordained for you to be. I happen to believe God has got some great plans for the church of Jesus Christ. I think we're moving into the greatest time that we have ever known. And because of that, we want to be involved in what it means to become. So we begin to back up and ask ourselves, what does it mean to become what Jesus has called us to be? If you could turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. You'll recognize the Great Commission very easily. In verses 19 and 20, we're told that there's something that Jesus wants us to do. He says, I want you to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you, and, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. You know, sometimes we make a mistake and we think that when we do a baptism service like we just had, we fulfilled the Great Commission. But that's not the fulfillment of it. I'm not even convinced that that was meant to be a formula for baptism. What I am convinced of is that we were told to make disciples and help them to become what he created them to be. You and I were called to help people become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. And I've discovered something in my life. I don't know if you've discovered it in yours. I'm ill-equipped by myself to make that trip. Have you ever tried to take off on a trip and found out you didn't know where you were going? I remember one time I was going on a college recruiting trip. And I was very much of a tweener athlete. So it was one of those, yeah, you come up here. They didn't pay for my way. And so I, I get in the car and I'm not sure where to go. And so I asked my football coach at the time. I said, hey, could you show on the map the directions? I won't give you his name because he took out a black magic marker and drew the line. I was like, that wasn't very helpful. Thank you. All the road names are covered in black now. Well, sometimes you take off on a trip, and so basically we took off knowing we were heading north. It was just, we found it. But the idea is sometimes we take off and we don't kind of know how to get there. Well, that is the beauty of the body of Christ as we come together. And the Bible says that iron begins to sharpen iron, and we begin to help one another arrive at the destiny of Christ's likeness. But you know, sometimes we, we even mistake what discipleship is. We mistake and we wonder, what does it mean to become? And I've talked to all of our small group leaders. I want you to know, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. There's no Christians and then disciples. It's not a hierarchy of Christianity. It's not an elitism. It is a decision to follow Jesus Christ, and it makes you a disciple, an apprentice, a follower. And so all of our groups and our ministries are being built around that. Our children's ministries are being built around helping people not only enjoy the presence of God, but molding their lives and training them in Christ-likeness. Well, what does that mean to be trained into Christ-likeness? I think there's a part of the Great Commission that we leave out because we are so quick to memorize Matthew 28. We forget many times about Mark 16. In Mark 16, verses 15 through 18, it says this. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. 
So we first must know what we're supposed to be preaching. The gospel. The gospel is the good news that you're invited into the kingdom of God now and forever. It is the cross, but it moves beyond the cross. It is the entryway to and the life in Jesus Christ, kingdom living. We go to preach that good news. You're invited in, no matter who you are, into the kingdom of God if you'll accept it through Jesus Christ. He says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who do not, does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. And my name, in whose name? Christ's name and Jesus' name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up servants and they will drink uh, anything deadly. It will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. I mean, when we begin to think about this, now, I'm not going to go up to Tennessee and do any snake handling, just in case you're wondering. If you like to handle snakes, call someone else. I'm not into that. I'm not going to pick up any poison and drink it just to put the Lord thy God to the test. But I do know this. When living my life as the kingdom, as a child of Jesus Christ, as one living in the kingdom, and those things come across my path, I will not fear that which is poisonous because greater is he that is in me than he that is in that. When I walk across people that are lame and sick, I assume that this is a divine appointment where I'm to lay hands and to pray for them and to see healing come into their lives. We are children of God. We live in the kingdom of God. And he said, these signs will follow us. We will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. We will speak to the dead and they will rise up. We will be in situations where the enemy is trying to destroy us and we'll go through unscathed. We have a gospel of the kingdom of living in the kingdom looks different than living in the world it is full of power it is full of destiny it is full of purpose it is full of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ we study to show ourselves approved we read to understand better but we never replace what it is to function in the body of Jesus Christ we enhance it there's no way that you should go through studying God's Word or Scripture or any curriculum and give away that which Jesus has given us. He has given us all authority has been given unto me. And I say unto you, go! Go based on what? The authority that I'm trusting you with. It is imparted, imputed authority into our lives. I love the church of Jesus Christ because He's called us to kingdom living. I want you to know that God is doing some wonderful things in our body. And I want you to think about it. I want to begin painting a picture for you of what I believe God's called us to be. God has called us to be, in my estimation, a training center for the kingdom living. For living in the kingdom, for the gospel of Jesus Christ. That we will learn to train what it means to live in that kingdom. And God is beginning to add people into our midst. When we look around, there's around 700 people in the sanctuary right now. Last Wednesday night, Jerry Rogers and uh, uh, David Wagner both came to me and said, we serve more dinners Wednesday night than we have since we've been at MLK. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? That's huge. Now, there were more meals served back on 16th Street when it first started, I believe. But since we've been at MLK, they were excited about that. We began to talk to Sandy and to uh, Pastor Risa, Pastor Sandy and Pastor Risa, and we're finding some things out. We are quickly outgrowing our children's departments. We are quickly out, uh, we're not able to train them effectively for the kingdom of God because we have them crammed into a small area. We can seat up to 1,200 people in this sanctuary, and we can seat about 210 people comfortably in the children's areas. That doesn't match. And if God's called us to be what he's called us to be, I happen to believe if we're going to do it, we might as well do it as unto the Lord, which means with excellence. And we need to train our children with excellence. We need to have what we can give, and we can give better. We can do more. We have a plan to increase the size of our children's ministries back there, quadruple the space. It's going to be huge. It's going to be beautiful. But guess what? It's not going to happen because our budget can sustain it. 
It's going to happen because people begin to grab a vision of being a training center for the kingdom of God and realizing that part of that is training our families in the way they should go so that when they are older they will not depart. Part of it is saying someone that says, I don't have a child there, but I believe in the vision of there and I'm going to give to it. We need to train our kids to honor the sanctuary. There's no way to train them to honor the sanctuary when we have them checking in, picking up, playing across the back pews, running across them, worshiping in them, receiving Christ in them, and listening to a Bible study all in the exact same room. Anybody would tell you, you can't do that. What would we look like on Sunday morning if we ran across the pews and played? And then I will sit up here and said, okay, y'all settle down. Let's get ready. How long would it take? And we're adults. Many people would leave confused and frustrated. We don't want to do that. God is growing our body. We need to be at a place where we're about 850, about 150 people away, where we need to begin to move into two services. So guess what? We're going to start looking at. When you start hearing me say, hey, we've got around 750, 775 people on average, we're going to have to look at two services eventually. 850, we're going to have to go to two services. So we begin planning for that. Because why? God is preparing us for something wonderful. God is preparing us not just to grab a pile of people, but to be a place where people can come, be trained and equipped to take back into their homes, back into their churches, back into their areas of ministry to see the greatest move I believe God has ever unleashed on planet Earth is coming ahead of us. Do you believe that with me? Now beyond a clap of the hand, I want to ask you, do you believe the greatest is before us and not behind us? Do you believe that? Well, there's a place where we must begin to make the decisions now to prepare for that which is going to come. I refuse to be the farmer looking at the empty field and wonder why I have no corn. And my buddy walks over to me and says, because you didn't plant when the, you were supposed to. You didn't sow seed because you were afraid there wouldn't be a harvest. I want to be the farmer out there throwing seed into a field that doesn't have anything but dirt on it because we know that when the rains come and the season arrives, there's going to be a great harvest for the kingdom of God. And I have a vision for the future of Community Church that I believe God has ordained. Sonny Shelton has shared. Richard has shared. Pastor has shared. The greatest is before us, but we must work together. Together. Our large commons out there is going to be transformed. It's going to begin to be a place where people can come and begin to say, I want to sit and visit here. I, I feel like I'm walking into the living room of a home I want to sit and talk to. I want to sit with my friends and visit. I see the cafe expanding so that people can come during the week and sit down and, and talk. And I'm, I've already planned on stealing pastor's vision for God Talk Cafe and saying, hey, pastor's going to be up here maybe and He's going to be here at noon and eating a sandwich and talking about God with you. We're going to sit around and begin to understand that we're going to learn about Jesus not by having special events only, but by making the conversation of the kingdom a part of our natural life. That is where societal change begins to happen. What I'm talking about is a, a, a renewing, a rebuilding, a restructuring for a purpose, not just to do it, but because God has called us to have facilities that will complement the vision he's given us. And we will begin to see things happen. I'm telling you, God's doing it already. We've seen people come in already, new faces, some old faces. I happen to believe God has laid something on my heart. I'll share with you now. I've been holding it, but I believe it's time to share it now. That God is telling us to begin to call our children home. I take that to mean not only our physical kids, but the children of this house that have been a wayward. Maybe they've just gone out. Maybe they've been in other places that he's ready to say, come home. The season is now. The time is now. I have a place for you. I have a destiny for you. We've got to prepare for that, friends. God has called us to be a part, and I believe he wants us to be the head and not the tail. I believe he wants us to be a part of an end times move that will shake this world and prepare for his call. And I want to be at the front of it. Not arrogantly, but because I believe in who we are. I'm telling you, I don't have to put another church down to build us up. I can just tell you, God has a special anointing on this body. I won't apologize for it and I won't be braggadocious with it. I will just acknowledge it. 
God has blessed us. When we can have people, amen? We will send out worshipers. We will send out teachers. Chester was up here talking, not because he has a wonderful voice, not even because we like his ponytail, but because he will be standing in many platforms, in many pulpits, sharing a story of a changed destiny. We are training people for the kingdom of God. That is what we're about. But I also love community church because we do life together. Romans 12, 15 and 16 says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind towards one another. We celebrate together. We hurt together. We grow together. We change together. It is something about doing life together that makes community so special. If you ever just come in on Sunday morning and drift out until next Sunday morning, you're missing the body of Christ at its best. Sunday mornings, we want to experience God's presence. We want to inspire with teaching and cause people to want to go and become. But when you begin to get life on life, and you invite people into your heart, and you open your heart to others, God begins to change things inside you. And we do discipleship, life on life. Now, we do a great job of rejoicing together. Richard went into the hospital, had a stent put in. We rejoice the fact that Richard is here with us this morning. Amen? <laughs> Lee Brown was in the hospital saying, family, come in. Lee said, hey, I'm not ready to die. I don't know what your family coming in for. You better just be coming for a visit. <laughs> He's so committed to living that he believes God had given him a promise to live to be 100. Someone asked me, what do you think about that? I said, I don't have to think about it. I just take his promise. We don't have to judge his promise. We just say, okay, I'll, I'll believe with you for your promise. And the doctor comes in and says, well, what kind of, what kind of, uh, 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 Lynette, help me. Uh, when you talk, what, what kind of life-saving uh, things do you want us to put in place? Thank you, Lynette. And, uh, he said, I tell you what, I'm supposed to live to 100. You better put in everything in me you got because I'm not quitting. And now he's getting stronger. And he's at Meadows, and in about 10 days, he's going to be back home. When people are ready to write him off, we rejoice with those who rejoice. But you know what? We also weep with those who weep. Romans 8, 28 is there for a reason. For all things work together for good to those that love God and call according to His purposes. When we hurt, when someone in the church loses a family member and they prayed for them too and they believed for them too and they go home and they find an ultimate healing in the hands of Jesus. I'm telling you, we did not lose, but we weep and we hurt for one another. I'm telling you, the body of Christ must learn to weep together as well as it rejoices together. Not because we accept defeat, but because we love radically. When you love, you hurt at times. When you love, you rejoice. And you know you're rejoicing when you can rejoice about things, when other people accomplish what you can't. You'll notice on Sunday mornings when I talk about being a training center and allowing, you'll notice that Dennis Powell's up here teaching on offerings, David Wagner, uh, Gene Allen, Dan Brack, uh, Jerry, Dan, and Matt are doing the, uh, the uh, closing at the end of the service. Brother David gets up. We'll have other people. Why are we doing that? Because we believe that we are training and we're sharing and we rejoice when other people do well. I'll tell you what, if someone left this morning and said, that is the best teaching on giving I've ever heard. And I overheard that and I thought, it was good. That's two weeks in a row Dennis did well. Uh-oh, he better never teach again. They may like him more than they like me. That's a problem, but that exists in the church. But when we can say, he did awesome, and I rejoice in that, when we can say, Chester did an amazing job and rejoice in that, we begin to celebrate with one another, and we destroy competition, and we unleash the body of Christ, and that is when we become what we were called to become. I love community church, not only because... It's a place to become and a place to, 
do life together. But I believe it's a place that's unique in this. Where we can experience God's presence together. Now we know, I believe it's in Psalm 137, maybe 139 verse 7. It says, where can I go to get away from the presence of God? Nowhere. Can't go to the highest heaven, the lowest hell. I can't escape the presence of God. And yet there are times that God's omnipresence, His everywhere presence, becomes manifest presence. And we begin to see Him and feel Him and experience Him in a new way, in a deeper way. Now, when I talk about worship at community church, I'm not content saying God is omnipresent. That's a fact. But that fact by itself does not change me. But when His presence begins to be manifest in my presence, and I begin to feel Him, and I begin to be in awe of His power, and, my, and He begins to get on the inside of me, and begins to push those things that are in me that He doesn't like, and He doesn't say change, He says make room for me. And He begins to push them out of my life, and I begin to change in His presence. I recognize that I am in the presence of a holy God. And that holy God loves me so much that he changes me from the inside out. Not what the law or rules or religion could do for me. And, he, and I'm not unique. God's no respecter of persons. He does that for all of us. I began to think about the times where Jesus said, I believe it's in John chapter 14, verse 15. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will, those who keep my commandments, I will manifest myself. What does that mean? He's talking about when he goes away. If you'll love one another, the commandment there was to love. If you'll love one another, he will remove the veil and reveal himself. Why do I love community church? Because I choose to love community church. Because I want God to say, here I am. It's not because I want to brag and say we're better. It's because I want to create an atmosphere that makes it really easy for God to say, When you seek me with all of your heart, you'll find me. And you seek me best when you love those who love me. When you love those whom I love. And I discovered something about those two things. I was really good at loving those who loved him. But I discovered that I didn't have an inkling of loving those who he loved. Because I remembered somewhere in John 3, 16, that for God so loved the whole world. And there's some people in that whole world out there that I'm going, 7 billion? I don't like a lot of them. And yet, he's saying, if you'll keep this commandment to love, I'll reveal myself to you. You want God to reveal himself to you? You want to see his manifest presence? Love your enemy. You want to experience His manifest presence? Love your spouse sacrificially. You want to experience His manifest presence? Begin to love someone unselfishly. Begin to allow the love of God. And I'm telling you, that's what I love about community church. It's a place where we begin to experience His presence and we can tap into it at a brand new level. In Luke 9, we were reading this week in our staff uh, Bible study. In our staff study, we were going over some a book called The Divine Conspiracy. And in that chapter, it talked about the Mount of Transfiguration. And at that moment, that really, those that were at the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John, got to see Jesus in the way Jesus is really intended to be seen. Transformed. Radiant. And they got to see the manifest presence of God. I want to be that kind of church. I want to take that kind of life and begin to share it over and over and over again. This morning, as as we begin to move toward our destiny in Christ, and we begin to see that God is bringing us to a place where we see our numbers beginning to swell and our giving beginning to increase and our need for expansion to begin to happen and our need to reach out and love each other more. You know what? The more people God sends, the more we're going to be challenged to love. 
I discovered that in Illinois the hard way. Our church had begun to grow at, in that town exponentially. When I say exponentially, it's still small. It's just a lot of growth. And one day a lady stood up. And she raised her hand in a congregational meeting. And she said, Pastor, can all these new people just go home so I can have my church back? Now what had happened? She loved her church too. But in the wrong way. She loved her church seat. And if someone sat in her seat, they got yelled at. She loved the, the church cupboard. And the dishes were so-so and the handles were turned to 2 o'clock. So that they could be grabbed easily. And the new people sat in her seat. And they put the church cups at 6 o'clock. Not two o'clock. And this lady struggled because she couldn't see that the church was never the building, but was always the people. God is going to send as many people here as we're prepared to minister to. And we're only prepared to minister to as many as we're prepared to love sacrificially. And so this morning, I want to ask you some questions. Prayer partners, will you make your way up? I want to tell you that the first place we start with a sacrificial love is with Jesus Christ. If you're here this morning and you haven't experienced the love of Christ in your life, I'm asking you to do something impossible is to love that way. So the first place we start is letting Jesus become that great I am in my life and beginning to love me. But then beyond that, in the next few weeks, we're going to begin to lay out a plan for expansion and growth. And in that point, you're going to begin to be asked if you'll join in with that vision. And if you'll sow seeds into that field. And some of you are going to be asked to sow seeds into a field that they never intend to play in but a generation after them will play in. And I have to ask the question, do we love the kingdom enough to give sacrificially to the seed that we may never eat and yet reap a harvest? Because God has called us to be a training center for a mighty move of God. He wants to reach your neighbors and their kids. He wants to reach your co-workers. He wants to reach into your homes and get your teenagers. He wants to reach into college dorms and pull those prodigals home. He wants to reach over into Simmons Drive and some of the back streets off of Simmons and lift some people out of some crack houses and meth labs. He wants to reach in and begin to pull people that sell their bodies because they do not know the love and the resources of their Father. And He wants to take them and He's, I believe He's holding them in His hands and He's saying, who can I trust with these souls? Who can I trust with my scarred kids? I'm holding them in my hands and they, they've let their teeth rot out, I know. They've got track marks up their arms and their self-esteem is in the toilet, I know. But I love them and they're my kids. Community, will you love them with me? Will you love their kids because they don't know how to raise them? Will you help raise them? I know your grandkids are gone and you don't have any kids back there. I know that, but will you invest for a drug addict's kids? Because that drug addict just became my kid. I can't say I love my church if I don't love God's kids. Will you hold your hands out and say, God, give me some of your kids. Trust me with some of your kids. I want them. I want to open my heart to them. I want to love them. 
I'm willing to even be taken advantage of because I trust you. Hands can't be hands of healing if they can't be hands that'll hold. Father, we come to you this morning and we hold our hands together in a posture of receiving souls from your hands. We call our kids home. We call your kids home. Some are coming home and they're going to be ready to train with us and be trainers. And some are going to come and they need to be trained. And they're going to have kids and they need to be trained. And Lord, we know that we must build to prepare. So Father, as we hold our hands open for your kids, we also hold our hands open with our resources. Begin this week, Father, to speak to us without a goal that we artificially set because of architects and contractors. But you begin to speak into our hearts about what you have, about what you see, and we will commit to meeting that. With every head bowed and all your eyes closed, you can put your hands down now. If you're here this morning and you do not know Jesus as your Savior, you're one of the ones that need love. You want to be loved. You feel like you haven't been loved. But I want you to know that God the Father loves you. He loved you so much He died. He sent His Son and He died for you. If you're here this morning and you need to know that love, I want you to raise your hand. You need to know the love of God in your life. This morning, God saw fit to place us with a family together. And so I want you to know this morning that I've challenged you, but I've also challenge myself to allow myself to experience parts of love that I haven't before. So as these, as these prayer partners are here, if you'll stand to your feet. Father, as we transition the service, I ask that as those that are here this morning that need to pray with someone, need to talk to someone about your love, will be able to have this opportunity. Father, meet us and help us to accomplish that which you've called us to. We're going to have our prayer partners here. Mary Beth and I are going to go out to meet our guests and the visitors. Pastor Dan's going to come and dismiss you in just a moment. But these prayer partners are here for you. If you need to pray with someone, if God's speaking to you in a way that maybe I didn't even touch on today, these prayer partners are here for you. And let me say this, community church, I love you. I love you. You're the God of the sea. You're the King of these people. You're the Lord of this nation. You are. And you're the light in this darkness. You're the hope to the hopeless. You're the peace to the restless. You are. And there is no one like our God. There is no one like our God. There is no one like you. And there is no one like our God. Oh, there. Pastor encouraged us this week. 
He challenged us as a church to love, to take those people who God's loved and for us to get a chance to love them, to show his love. Will you do that? We are a blessed people. I love community church. This is where I grew up. This church has loved me when I wasn't lovable. It loved me when I hurt, when my family cried because of the, the loss of my son. You surrounded us. You loved us. And you still love us. I love community church. And my story is just is, is repeated over and over again throughout this whole body. Because it's who we are. A church that loves. Amen. We are blessed. Orange is blessed. We're a blessed people. We have God's favor. Amen. I speak a blessing over this body today that we are blessed. We're blessed in the neighborhoods we lived in. That we are a blessing in those neighborhoods. We are a blessing at our jobs. That we have favor with our employment. And those who don't yet have employment find favor with their future employees and employers. That we are a blessed people. That we go this week knowing that we are blessed and we represent. The Bible says that we are his ambassadors. That we represent him this week in our jobs, in our city, wherever we go. Amen. We are blessed. Go with God. Have a great week. You're the God of this city. You're the King of this people. You're the Lord of this nation. You are. You're the light in this darkness, God. You're the hope to the hopeless. You're the peace to the restless.
Greater things are still to be done in this city.